Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing sarcoidosis. Okay, so remember we're currently in the process of discussing the pathogenesis of tuberculosis because of the incredible similarities between tuberculosis and sarcoidosis and the fact that tuberculosis is much better understood than sarcoidosis. So it's a good um, disease to study in order to gain some insight about sarcoidosis. Okay, so we just had an inflammatory response to tuberculosis, and we've discussed that actually this inflammatory response isn't really going to bring the tuberculosis infection under control. Instead, what we're going to have to initiate is a T-helper 1 mediated adaptive immune response, and this is what's going to uh, now bring the mycobacterium tuberculosis infection under control. Okay, so whenever you're initiating a T-cell adaptive immune response, which this is going to be, it always begins with antigen presentation. So that's the point that I want to start off with, antigen presentation by an antigen presenting cell. So I think actually we'll go on to a new piece of paper to begin this discussion of the adaptive immune response. So here's a fresh piece of paper and let's now actually begin with antigen presentation. So the first concept that we need to develop is the concept of an antigen presenting cell which is often abbreviated down to an APC so this stands for an antigen presenting cell. So these are cells that are actually capable of activating T cells which are the major cells of the adaptive immune response. Okay, and the two major types of antigen presenting cells are dendritic cells and macrophages. Majorly dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are the absolute best antigen presenting cell. Macrophages are less good at it, but they can certainly do it as well. Okay, so these cells are going to present antigen fragments from the pathogen that we want to initiate a T-cell response to. So let me draw this process. This process is, by the way, of course, called antigen presentation. So I'm going to draw out the process for antigen presentation for you now. Now, for the basis of this picture, I'm going to draw antigen presentation for a macrophage rather than a dendritic cell. Now, I've just said that dendritic cells are actually much more involved in doing this. They're much better at antigen presentation than macrophages. However, um, macrophages are easier to draw, and for that reason I'm going to draw all the pictures for a macrophage. So, we've seen that dendritic cells and macrophages, they're both going to be phagocytosing mycobacterium tuberculosis bacterial cells. And we know that often this is going to actually fail to break down the bacterial cell, and the bacterial cell will survive inside the phagosome and reproduce and then burst the phagocyte open. However, some of the macrophages and some of the dendritic cells, i.e. some of the antigen-presenting cells, will actually successfully break the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell down. And these are the cells that will then be able to go and present uh, the antigen fragments from the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell to T cells to activate the adaptive immune response. So, let me show this. So I'm drawing out a macrophage here, so as usual it's a great big blob of a cell. Here is its nucleus, and let's say in here this is the phagosome where we have our mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, I just want to develop the concept of an antigen because this is extremely important for you to understand before we go any further with our discussion of the adaptive immune response. What is meant by an antigen? An antigen is a protein molecule that is capable of having an adaptive immune response initiated against it. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, it will have all sorts of proteins that could have adaptive immune responses initiated against it because these proteins are very different from human proteins and therefore if we launch an adaptive immune response against those proteins, it's not going to attack our own cells, it's not going to affect our own cells. So, 
That's what this adaptive immune response is going to be against. The antigens of Mycobacterium tuberculosis are just drawing out a Mycobacterium tuberculosis cell larger here. It could have all sorts of different proteins that we could launch adaptive immune responses against. So I'm just showing some of these crudely here. So let's color this one in in orange, this one in in green, okay, and this one in in purple, this one in in blue, we could launch adaptive immune responses against all of these different proteins and therefore they're all referred to as the Mycobacterium tuberculosis antigens. In fact, going back even further, I suppose I should do a speech about the difference between the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So, going right back to the beginning then, the adaptive immune response, the reason it's known as the adaptive immune response is that the cells that we're going to be activating in the adaptive immune response are going to be specifically targeted against proteins of the pathogen that is actually invading at the time that the immune response is being initiated against. The innate immune response, which is all the stuff that we've seen so far, the alveolar macrophages and the alveolar dendritic cells phagocytosing, uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, the bringing in the neutrophils and the more macrophages and the complement proteins to attack the mycobacterium tuberculosis. All of that was the innate immune response because it's the same response that we would initiate against any pathogen that was doing this that was infecting our tissue, whereas the adaptive immune response, also known as the specific immune response, we're going to activate cells that are specifically targeted against antigens of the pathogen that is infecting us at the time. Okay, so we're going to be launching adaptive immune responses against the antigens of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay, right, so back now to antigen presentation. So in order to activate these T cells that are going to be directed against the antigens of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, an antigen presenting cell has to process the antigens from Mycobacterium tuberculosis and present them to T cells in order to try and activate them. Okay, so this is what's going to be happening here. This is our antigen presenting cell here drawn as a macrophage for a simple picture but it will more often be a dendritic cell and it's going to be breaking down the Mycobacterium tuberculosis successfully so it's one of these rare occasions where Mycobacterium tuberculosis is going to be broken down successfully and this means that it's going to end up chopping up all of the different antigens of Mycobacterium tuberculosis into lots of little fragments and it's these fragments that can then be put on the surface of the antigen presenting cell to display to T cells to try and activate the adaptive immune response. So on the surface of the T cell, uh, sorry, on the surface of the antigen presenting cell here, we have special protein complexes known as MHC class two protein complexes. And this stands for, I'll write it out down here, the major histocompatibility, so the M is for major, the H is for histocompatibility, a huge great word here, histocompatibility, I think I've spelt it right there, and then it's complex, that's the C, and then the 2 is for class 2, so there is a major histocompatibility class 1, which we're not going to be discussing because it's not relevant to the adaptive immune response that we're going to initiate against Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, is going to involve MHC class 2 majorly. Okay. So antigen presenting cells, they have on their surface loads of these MHC class 2 protein complexes on their surface. So this is a protein complex consisting of multiple polypeptides that make it up. And it will have absolutely loads of these. So this picture is completely out of scale here. Um, you'd have absolutely thousands of these MHC class 2 protein complexes on the surface of a single antigen presenting cell. And what can happen is you see how I've drawn this little um, indentation here. This is actually what's known as the peptide binding groove of MHC class 2. So I'll write that key phrase down here. So peptide binding groove. And in that peptide binding groove, a little peptide from one of the antigens of Mycobacterium tuberculosis can be put. So the peptide binding groove can have
little fragments of polypeptides put in there. So I'll show this here. So a little fragment of a polypeptide can sit in that peptide binding groove, and it can accept peptide fragments between 12 and 20 amino acids long. So the peptide binding groove of MHC class 2 can accept peptide fragments between 12 and 20 amino acids long. So that line that I've drawn there, which I'm now colouring in in orange, that is a peptide fragment of between 12 and 20 amino acids long. So alpha alpha means amino acids. Okay, so to tell you then the full story here, uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis is going to be broken down by this antigen-presenting cell here, and it's going to break down all of the antigens of mycobacterium tuberculosis into little peptide fragments, and these peptide fragments are going to be put in the peptide binding grooves of MHC class 2 protein complexes on the surface of the antigen presenting cell. So this antigen presenting cell is going to end up coated in loads of different peptide fragments from loads of different antigens of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And even from the same type of antigen. I mean, if you think about a mycobacterium tuberculosis cell, it will have loads of copies, most likely, of a single antigen, so green antigen here. It's unlikely just to have one copy of that protein, so it'll probably have another copy here. So when these two different um, copies of this antigen are broken down, they might be cut up in different ways, giving rise to different peptide fragments. So you'll end up with a huge, great mixture of peptide fragments from the antigens of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay, and we're going to see that the cells that the antigen-presenting cell is going to activate, the T-cells, they are going to be targeted against a specific peptide fragment of a specific antigen of a pathogen. Okay, but we'll come back to that later on. Okay, so now let's go through what's going to happen to the antigen presenting cell next. So it has successfully phagocytosed uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell, and it's put fragments of the antigens of the mycobacterium tuberculosis cell on its surface in the peptide binding grooves of MHC class 2 protein complexes. What it's now going to do is it's going to go to activate T cells. Now how is it going to find T cells? Well, one of the major places that T cells hang out is in lymph nodes. So actually the way that this antigen presenting cell is going to find T cells is by draining through the lymphatic vessels to the mediastinal lymph nodes uh, of the lung. Okay, right. Uh, well, which drain the lung, rather. Okay, so if I just draw this here, so let's have this as our alveolar duct here. So what we're now going to have is a little lymphatic vessel shown here. It will gradually join up with loads of other lymphatic vessels to draw well, to become a bigger and bigger lymphatic vessel, and then eventually it will leave the lung and drain into one of the mediastinal lymph nodes, and I'm now going to draw a mediastinal lymph node here. Okay, and this could be a lymph node anywhere in the body rather than just being a mediastinal lymph node. Uh, as far as the picture is concerned, it would be exactly the same, so there's not a special appearance to the mediastinal lymph node, but of course this um, antigen presenting cell is going to go to one of the mediastinal lymph nodes because it's coming from the lungs. Okay, so here is my basic picture then of a lymph node. So you can see that there are lots of lymphatic vessels coming in, so all of these ones here, which I'll colour in in pink, just making sure it's still in view, uh, all of these ones that I'm colouring in here in pink, these are afferent lymphatic vessels. Okay, so the word afferent means coming into. So these are all lymphatic vessels coming into the lymph node, so afferent lymphatic vessels. And you can see that they're all draining into a space here around the outside of the uh, lymph node. So this space here, which I'm colouring in also in pink there, that's what's known as the marginal sinus of the lymph node. So this is the marginal sinus. So all of the lymph that is coming into this lymph node from the afferent lymphatic vessels is going to go into the marginal sinus of the lymph node. And now, where is it going to go from there? Well, it has to get down to this lymphatic vessel here. You see, this is the one lymphatic vessel that drains this lymph node. This is the efferent lymph vessel, okay? 
efferent means coming out of. So this is the lymphatic vessel coming out of this lymph node. And this is the one and only efferent lymphatic vessel. So each lymph node has many afferent lymphatic vessels, but only one efferent lymphatic vessel. Now, in order for the lymph that is in the marginal sinus to get to the efferent lymphatic vessel, it has to get to a little sinus right at the center of the lymph node here, which is called the medullary sinus of the lymph node. So this sinus here, this is the medullary sinus. And I'll color that also in a blue here. Right, so now what we can see is that the lymph that is coming into the marginal sinus of the lymph node around the edge has got to somehow drain to the medullary sinus right in the middle so that it can then drain into the efferent lymphatic vessel. Now in order to get from here to here it has to go through all of this solid portion of the lymph node here which is the portion where you have all of the special cells of the immune system located. Special types of white blood cells known as lymphocytes are going to be located in here. And there are two major types of lymphocytes. There are T lymphocytes and there are B lymphocytes. For our discussion of the adaptive immune response to tuberculosis, we're not going to be interested at all in the B lymphocytes. We're just going to be interested in the T lymphocytes. So this solid portion of the lymph node tissue then, it can be divided up into two separate regions. The outer portion here is known as the cortex of the lymph node, and the inner portion here is known as the paracortex. Now what's the difference between the cortex and the paracortex? Well the cortex contains B cell follicles. So the B cells, the B lymphocytes, so B lymphocytes are also called B cells and T lymphocytes are also called T cells for short. B cells, they are clustered together in these structures known as B cell follicles, and the B cell follicles are strictly located in the cortex and not in the paracortex. So around the outside of the uh, lymph node you have these B cell follicles here. So these red structures consist of absolutely loads of B lymphocytes all clustered into a great big sphere here. So this is a B cell follicle. Well, each one of these is a B cell follicle. And then all of the surrounding tissue, so all of the tissue in the cortex that surrounds the B cell follicles, and all of the tissue in the paracortex, so all of this tissue which I'll colour in, in yellow here, this consists of T cells, so surrounding the B cell follicles in the cortex and then also in the paracortex you have loads and loads of T cells, so all of this tissue is made up of loads and loads of T cells. So now let me paint a picture then of what lymph nodes are actually doing, and I suppose I should actually just give this the title, it is a lymph node here. So what do lymph nodes actually do? Well, the idea is that they're involved in immune surveillance. All tissues in the body are going to have lymphatic drainage, and this lymphatic fluid that's coming from all the tissues in the body is going to, at some point, have to go for a lymph node. And in the lymph nodes, you have a huge number of these special leukocytes known as lymphocytes. And these are cells of the adaptive immune response. So the basic idea is that these cells can look out for anything that's in the lymphatic fluid that shouldn't be there. They can look out for signs of infection. So they are involved in immune surveillance. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit the word surveillance in there, but I'll have a good go. Immune surveillance there. Okay, so the lymphatic fluid has to percolate through all of the solid tissue here to get from the marginal sinus to the medullary sinus, and therefore the lymphocytes get to have a very good look at what's inside this lymphatic fluid and decide if there's anything dangerous inside that lymphatic fluid, which shows that the tissues whose lymphatic fluid drains into that lymph node are potentially infected. So it's all about immune surveillance. That's the function of lymph nodes. Okay, right. So what's now going to happen then is our antigen-presenting cell over here Okay, which has successfully phagocytosed a mycobacterium tuberculosis cell and has got uh, MHC class 2 protein complexes on its surface with loads of antigen fragments from mycobacterium tuberculosis as antigens on its surface. It's going to come through the lymphatic vessels to one of the mediastinal lymph nodes.
and now it's going to come in contact with loads and loads of lymphocytes. Now it's not going to be capable of activating B cells, it's going to be capable of activating T cells. So now what we need to discuss is T cells. So here comes the big discussion of the adaptive immune response. So some incredibly important concepts then about these very powerful cells known as T cells. Okay, so the first thing that I want to say is that T cells can be divided into two great populations. There are the CD4 positive T cells, which are also known as the helper T cells, so T subscript H for short, so these are helper T cells to give them their full name. Okay, that's one great population of T cells. And then the other great population of T cells is the CD8 positive T cells, also known as cytotoxic T cells. Okay, or T subscript C, like so. So these are the cytotoxic T cells. And what does the CD4 positive or CD8 positive actually refer to here? Well, it refers to one of the molecules that is on the surface of the cell membrane of a T cell. So on the surface membrane of a T cell, you either have CD4 molecules, in which case you are a CD4 positive T cell, also known as a helper T cell, or you have CD8 uh, molecules, in which case you are a CD8 positive T cell, also known as a cytotoxic T cell. So if I draw a little picture of a T cell, they all look like this, nice round cells with big nuclei. They're either going to have on their surface CD4 molecules, in which case they're this population, or they're going to have CD8 molecules, but they don't ever have both. Okay, so each T cell will have either CD4 molecules on its surface, or CD8 molecules on its surface. So we can instantly divide the T cells into these two great populations known as CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells. And they're interdispersed amongst one another. So it's not like all the CD4 ones are clustered in a certain area and then all the CD8 ones are somewhere else. They're all intermingled amongst one another. Okay, now these two populations of T cells are involved in very different adaptive immune responses. The helper T cells, the CD4 positive T cells, are the ones that are going to be activated by antigen presenting cells presenting fragments of antigens on MHC class 2 molecules, which is what we've discussed so far. So we're going to be activating these types of T cells. CD8 positive T cells are activated by antigen presenting cells presenting fragments of uh, antigens on MHC class 1 molecules, which we haven't done. They're involved in very different types of adaptive immune responses. They're involved in the sort of adaptive immune response that would be initiated to a virus, for instance. Okay, so we're going to do away with this population. We're not going to be interested in this population of T-cells at all. So we're instantly halving the number of T-cells that we have to pay attention to. We're just going to focus on this population here, the CD4 positive T cells. Okay, so you have a huge number of different CD4 positive T cells in your body. Okay, and the different CD4 positive T cells will be directed against different fragments of antigens. So, a really important concept is now coming up. So, let's draw out a picture again of a T cell here. So, we've now decided that we're only paying attention to the CD4 positive T cells. So on the surface of this T cell, you're going to have a CD4 molecule there, which I'll color in in orange. Now, the other really important protein complex that's on the surface of all T cells is what's known as the T cell receptor, which I'm going to draw here. So also, this T cell will be covered in a molecule known as its T cell receptor. And T cell receptors are what are going to recognize a certain fragment of a certain antigen. So this is the really important concept. If I was to go through this lymph node here and look at all the different T cells here, I would find very different T cell receptors on their surface. So each of the T cells that is sitting in the cortex and the paracortex of lymph nodes all over your body has a different design of T cell receptor. It has its own unique design of T cell receptor, okay? And it produces loads of copies of this unique design. So once it's got a design of T cell receptor, it sticks with that design and makes loads of copies of it. So it's not like 
uh, this T-cell can have multiple different designs of T-cell receptors? No, it makes one design of T-cell receptor and makes loads of copies of that T-cell receptor which it sticks all over its surface. Now, the T-cell receptor is capable of binding to MHC class 2 if we're talking about a CD4 positive T cell, which we are. Remember, we're just restricting our attention down to CD4 positive T cells now. The T cell receptor is capable of binding to MHC class 2 with a certain peptide fragment in the MHC class 2's peptide binding groove. Okay? So, this is what makes the T cell specific to a certain fragment of a certain antigen that its T-cell receptor design will only recognize a certain peptide uh, fragment from a certain antigen. So all the different T-cells of the body, they are specifically designed, specifically tailored against a certain fragment of a certain antigen. Okay? That's the really important concept. So we call these the different T-cell clones. So this is a really important piece of terminology. So we would say that in your body you have a huge number of different T-cell clones. The different T-cell clones are the T-cells that all have a certain design of T-cell receptor. You see, this is where it's complicated, because there might be multiple different T-cells in, let's say, your body, uh, which have the same design of T-cell receptor. They are all part of the same T-cell clone. They're all directed against the same peptide fragment from the same antigen. But you have a huge number of different T-cell clones uh, which have different designs of T-cell receptors and are directed against different peptide fragments. Okay, so the concept of a T-cell clone is all of the T-cells that you have in your body that have the same design of T-cell receptor and are therefore directed against the same uh, peptide fragment from the same antigen. And the T-cell clone might just be a single T-cell. You might only have one T-cell in your entire body or with that specific T-cell receptor design, or you might have a much larger population of T-cells all with that same T-cell receptor design. Okay, so I think that's enough of the basic introduction to T-cells. Let's now uh, actually continue on the story. So our antigen-presenting cell is coming up to this lymph node, and now to get from the marginal sinus to the medullary sinus, it's got to go through all of this T-cell tissue. And what it's going to try and do is it's going to try and activate CD4-positive T-cells. And to do so, it needs to find CD4-positive T-cells that have T-cell receptor designs that are complementary to one of the MHC class 2 peptide fragment complexes that it has on its surface. Now remember, this antigen-presenting cell, it's coated in loads of MHC class 2 protein complexes, which have loads of different peptide fragments presented in their peptide binding grooves. Remember, it chopped up all of the different antigens of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, it got loads of different fragments, and it's put all of them on MHC class 2 protein complexes, so it has a huge variety of different MHC class 2 peptide fragment complexes, so it just needs to find a T cell that has a T cell receptor design that is complementary to one of those MHC class 2 peptide fragment complexes, and then it can activate that CD4 positive T cell. Okay, so let's do so. So let's go through the activation process. So let's say this is our antigen presenting cell here. So here is the MHC class 2 that that so let's say that this is the MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex that is actually going to come in contact with a CD4 positive T cell that has a complementary T cell receptor design. So here it is. So here's the peptide fragment, so I'll just colour it in. So we'll have the MHC class 2 protein complex here in orange, and then we'll have the peptide fragment here in pink. So here is the nucleus of the antigen-presenting cell. I'll just label it up as an antigen-presenting cell. Okay, right. So now let me um, put the T cell that it's going to come into contact with here. So this is the T cell that has the complementary T cell receptor. 
Okay, so here's the nucleus of this T cell, and here is its T cell receptor, like so, on its surface that is binding to the MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex that we have here. So this is the um, T cell receptor here. And I'll just color this T cell receptor in, in red here. Okay, so this antigen presenting cell has happens to come across a CD4 positive T cell uh, that happens to have a complementary T cell receptor designed to be able to bind to this MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex, or one of these MHC class 2 peptide fragment complexes that it has on its surface. Okay, now this CD4 positive T cell, let's we're imagining, remember, that the person has never been exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis before. So this is most likely what we would call a naive CD4 positive T cell. So this is a naive CD4 positive T cell because it has never been activated before. Okay, it's never seen its um, peptide fragment that it's complementary to before because remember we've never been infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis before so since this is a fragment of the one of the antigens of mycobacterium tuberculosis this CD4 positive T cell is complementary to it will most likely never have been activated before okay so what's going to happen then is the MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex is going to bind to the T cell receptor like so and the CD4 molecule that's also on the surface of this T cell will also bind to the MHC class 2 complex like so so this is the CD4 and this is the reason that um, antigen presenting cells which have got their antigen fragments presented on MHC class 2 protein complexes can only activate CD4 positive T cells because CD4 binds to MHC class 2 whereas CD8 binds to MHC class 1 and it's essential that you get not just the T cell receptor binding to the MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex but also the CD4 so we refer to CD4 as the co-receptor here okay now the other important thing to say about CD4 is if you look at where I've drawn CD4 binding to the MHC class 2 you'll notice how it's binding or the way I've drawn it is it's binding on the side of the MHC class 2 it's not binding on the portion where uh, you actually see the peptide fragment so CD4 binds to the side of the MHC class 2 protein complex it doesn't bind in a way that's specific to what peptide fragment you have here. The binding of the T cell receptor to the MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex is completely specific, completely determined by the peptide fragment that's in here. But CD4 just binds to the side of the MHC class 2 protein complex, so it's not specific to what peptide fragment you have here. Okay, so what's going to happen now? Well, this is an antigen presenting cell presenting this fragment from mycobacterium tuberculosis antigens to this naive CD4 positive T cell that is directed against that antigen fragment. So what should now happen is activation. However, activation of T cells is very complicated, so this only actually delivers signal one of activation to the T cell. So this effectively delivers signal one to the naive CD4 positive T cell which is a pro-activation signal. It's going to start the activation process. However, if you just receive signal 1, that's not going to result in the activation of the naive CD4 positive T cell. In fact, what we will see in just a moment is that it actually results in exactly the opposite. You must receive not only signal 1, but also signal 2 to actually activate the naive CD4 positive T cell. So, where does signal 2 come from? Well, on the surface of this naive CD4 positive T cell, you have a receptor known as CD28. Okay, so I'll colour in CD28 here in pink. And if you activate CD28 by binding its ligands to it, that will result in signal 2 being delivered 
to the T cell for activation. And if you receive both signal 1 and signal 2 together, that will then lead to the next process in the activation of the naive CD4 positive T cell. So how does the antigen presenting cell activate the CD28 molecule here? Well, it has to put on its surface a molecule that is known as a B7 molecule. Now, there are two molecules that can actually perform this role. There is a molecule known as B7.1, and then there is another molecule known as B7.2. Now, they both perform the exact same role, so we're going to collectively call them just B7 molecules. Okay, so in order to get the CD28 molecule here on the surface of the uh, naive CD4 positive T cell to deliver signal 2 to this T cell here, you have to activate it by binding B7 to it. So that means that the antigen presenting cell has to put these B7 molecules on its surface. Now antigen presenting cells do not usually just have B7 molecules on their surface. Instead, they only express B7 molecules if pattern recognition receptors on their surface have been activated. So remember, long ago now, we discussed pattern recognition receptors. The, this is the umbrella term for all of those m m receptor molecules on the surface of sentinel cells, which can recognize pathogen-associated molecular patterns of pathogens. So when pattern recognition receptors on the surface of an antigen-presenting cell uh, get activated, it results in a signaling cascade which makes the antigen presenting cell express B7 molecules and put them on their surface. So, what's the point then of this? Well, this functions as a checkpoint. You see, what we want to absolutely make sure of is that this peptide fragment that is being presented on the MHC class 2 protein complex of this antigen presenting cell is not a peptide fragment from a self antigen. Okay? And this is a checkpoint to try and prevent that. You see, the antigen presenting cell is only going to successfully activate this naive CD4 positive T cell if it provides both signal 1 and signal 2. And to provide signal 2, it has to have seen a pathogen. It has to have had its pattern recognition receptors activated because only then will it put B7 molecules on its surface. So this makes it much more likely that this peptide fragment here is not a self-peptide fragment and that indeed this antigen presenting cell is presenting a peptide fragment from a pathogen rather than from a self-peptide. Now there are mechanisms to try and prevent you ever even producing CD4 positive T cells that have T cell receptors which recognize self-peptide fragments but they can sometimes go wrong and you can end up producing naive CD4 positive T cells which have a T cell receptor complementary to a self-peptide fragment on the MHC class 2 molecule. And therefore, this is a way of trying to prevent those T cells ever becoming activated because you can only activate a naive CD4 positive T cell if you're presenting a peptide fragment on MHC class 2 and you have the B7 molecules on your surface and you only have B7 molecules on your surface if you've actually seen a pathogen. Okay, so what would then happen if you just gave signal 1? Well, if you just gave signal 1 and not signal 2, then that would show that the antigen-presenting cell had not come in contact with a pathogen. So that would suggest that the, anti that the peptide fragment here was a self-peptide fragment, because how could you have possibly got a pathogen peptide fragment without getting your pattern recognition receptors activated? So if a CD4-positive naive T cell just received signal 1, it actually goes into a state known as energy, and in this energy state, it will never ever be activated. It doesn't cause it to die, the cell doesn't die, but it goes into this energy state where it lives out the rest of its life, never ever divides, okay, never ever can be activated, and then eventually it'll die and be removed from the bloodstream, and then that T-cell clone will just die out, is the idea, okay? So if you receive just signal 1 without signal 2, you go into this energic state, and this is a checkpoint. This is trying to prevent autoimmune diseases from occurring. Okay, so, however, we are presenting a peptide fragment from um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, so 
we do have the grounds for the correct grounds for activating naive CD4 positive T cells. So the antigen presenting cell will put B7 molecules on its surface and will deliver both signal 1 and signal 2 to the naive CD4 positive T cell. So what will happen next? Well, signal 1 and signal 2 together cause changes in gene expression inside this naive CD4 positive T cell and you start producing two very important molecules that are going to result in signal 3 and signal 3 will then actually trigger the full-on activation of the naive CD4 positive T cell. So you start producing interleukin 2 molecules and also the interleukin 2 receptor alpha component. So let me explain the logic here. So all of these naive CD4 positive T cells, long before they've ever been activated, they express two of the parts of the interleukin-2 receptor. So the interleukin-2 receptor is a trimer. It's made up of the interleukin-2 receptor alpha component, the interleukin-2 receptor beta component, and the interleukin-2 receptor gamma component. However, usually, naive CD4 positive T cells, i.e. CD4 positive T cells that have not been activated yet and are just sitting in the um, lymph nodes not doing anything, just waiting to be activated, they just have the interleukin-2 receptor beta component and the interleukin-2 receptor gamma component as shown by this simple picture here. So this is the interleukin-2 receptor beta component in blue here and this is the interleukin-2 receptor gamma component in red here. Okay, right. Now, when they receive signal 1 and signal 2, they're going to start producing the interleukin-2 receptor alpha component. This will go up to the cell membrane and then they'll have a full interleukin-2 receptor, which will actually be functional. So I should stress that the interleukin-2 receptor beta with the interleukin-2 receptor gamma is not functional. Okay, It's not going to function as an interleukin-2 receptor. You only function once you've got all three of the components. Okay, So you need the interleukin-2 receptor alpha component. So you'll start producing the interleukin-2 receptor alpha component and then you'll produce full-on interleukin-2 receptors as shown in this picture here. So that's one of the first changes that occurs when you have both signal 1 and signal 2. You start actually getting uh, proper complete interleukin-2 receptors uh, constructed on the surface of the uh, T cell. The T cell is also going to start producing interleukin-2 molecules, the ligand for the interleukin-2 receptor, which it will secrete from the cell, and then which will act on its own receptors. So it's going to secrete these molecules and they'll act on its own receptors. When you have signaling like that, where the cell secretes the molecule that acts on its own receptors, it's known as autocrine signaling. Auto means self, so this is signaling to yourself releasing a molecule to act on your own receptors. So the interleukin-2 will act on the interleukin-2 receptors and this will then deliver what's known as signal free of T-cell activation and that's when the T-cell will be full-on activated and will save the story of what will happen once the T-cell has been fully activated to the next video. So, to summarise what we've learnt in this video, um, we have seen that the adaptive immune response is going to be initiated by antigen presenting cells, so to go right back to the top here. So we're going to have alveolar macrophages, or rather just macrophages and dendritic cells, that have successfully digested the mycobacterium tuberculosis, broken down its antigens into fragments and put them on their MHC class 2 surface molecules. These are going to go via the lymphatics to the mediastinal lymph nodes and they're going to be looking for T cells that have a T cell receptor design that is complementary to one of the MHC class 2 peptide fragment complexes on the surface of the antigen presenting cell. And I want to stress that this means that you can actually launch multiple different uh, at adaptive immune responses against mycobacterium tuberculosis, all of these different peptide fragments, they could be activating different T-cell clones. Uh, so you can get loads of concurrent adaptive immune responses being initiated. Okay, we've just followed the story for one of these peptide fragments from one of the antigens of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So what's now going to happen then is the antigen presenting cell is going to 
find, hopefully, uh, a CD4 positive naive T cell which has a complementary T cell receptor to one of the NHC class 2 peptide fragment complexes and you're going to get this interaction forming. So firstly the MHC class 2 peptide fragment complex will bind to the T cell receptor and CD4 will also bind to the MHC class 2 protein complex. That will deliver signal 1 of activation to the naive CD4 positive T cell. To get signal 2 activation you need the B7 molecules which will be on the surface of the antigen presenting cell because this antigen presenting cell has had its pattern recognition receptors activated to bind to CD28 molecules on the surface of the naive CD4 positive T cell and that will deliver signal 2. And by the way this sort of interaction that we're forming here this is an example of what's called an immune synapse. So we say that there is an immune synapse forming between the antigen presenting cell and the naive CD4 positive T cell there. Then what will happen, once the naive CD4 positive T cell receives both signal 1 and signal 2 for activation, it will then initiate the steps to get signal 3. It will produce both interleukin-2 and interleukin-2 receptor alpha component. The interleukin-2 receptor alpha component will go to the cell membrane and bind with the interleukin-2 receptor beta component and the interleukin-2 receptor gamma component to produce four interleukin-2 receptors. The interleukin-2 will be secreted from the cell and will act on these four interleukin-2 receptors to deliver signal free of T-cell activation to the naive CD4 positive T-cell and we'll see what happens after signal free in the next video.